join me now in welcoming Dr. David Narrett, who certainly deserves to be recognized as one of our university's most interesting characters. <laughs> Well, thank you, Ben Usman, for that marvelous introduction and for all the great work that you do in the library and building up our special collections, which are very special indeed in the area of maps going back centuries uh, and dealing with the American as well as the global uh, past. And thanks to Evelyn Barker, too, of Library Communications and Marketing uh, for all the fantastic publicity. Uh, surrounding this uh, talk. Uh, yes, today I'd like to share with you some of the major themes, ideas, and maybe some of the characters uh, <laughs> featured in my book, uh, Adventurism and Empire, uh, which I expect to receive an advanced copy of just in the mail any day now. I was hoping it would come this morning <laughs> so I could hold it up to you, but uh, it is on its way, and you might, uh, if you're interested in the subject, it's available from University of North Carolina Press, as well as Amazon, of course, uh, where it's discounted already. Uh, and that, that can be uh, very favorable indeed uh, for consumers. Uh, so now I would like to introduce you to one of these characters, more colorful than myself. Um, uh, I get excited when I go into the archives and view these splendid uh, characters. Uh, whereas um, you get, whereby you have some vicarious uh, appreciation of historical uh, experience and the movements that have uh, shaped the continent. Now, one of the characters who's featured in the book, uh, William Augustus Bowles, is not necessarily a household name, but he's a very uh, interesting figure. Uh, who was born in Maryland in 1763, a momentous year in history because it was the year of the Treaty of Paris, ending the Seven Years' War, what's also known as the French and Indian War. And Bowles, uh, through adventures during the Revolutionary War, where he was a young Tory soldier uh, fighting with, alongside the British, uh, and against the American Whigs or Patriots, was transferred in his unit from Pennsylvania to Florida in 1779. But the British at that time had possession, <coughs> in a colonial terms, of both what were called East and West Florida. And so Bowles came to Pensacola in the year 1779 as a young soldier, and then he did what characters do, he deserted uh, after a row or a dispute, a fight with an officer, and he went uh, AWOL and went to live among the Creek Indians, or the Muscogees, uh, by their own language, or Muscogogies. Uh, and he lived in the household of a certain Creek headman who was named Perryman. He was English uh, and also Creek by ancestry. Uh, the son of a trader. And there Bowles had some familiarity learning the Muscogee language, also forming a liaison, even at a very early age for himself, uh, with one of um, Perryman's daughters, uh, Mary, uh, by whom he had a child. I don't know how much responsibility he exercised as a father, uh, but he, he did have the child. So what happened after the war? Uh, Bowles, this classic adventurer, and that's how I picture him in my book, because I'm relating him <laughs> to the title of it, book, the book, Adventurism and Empire. And he's one of these free-wheeling individuals who is displaced by the Revolutionary War, as thousands are. And after the war, as a loyalist soldier, and one who fought uh, against the Spanish uh, for the British, as well as against his native land, the America, he went into exile in the Bahamas. But he didn't stop there. And over the next 15 years, he would come back to Florida several times. And eventually, in the early 1790s, 
he appointed himself, really, with some Creek support, uh, but not necessarily the unanimity of the group, as the head or director of the Creek Nation. Uh, and then in the year 1799, when he would once again come to the Florida coast, he would declare an independent Indian state, a state of Muskogee. And that is quite a remarkable uh, fact. So I thought I would begin with the character and then talk about the issues by which we can understand him and place him in historic context. This context in which freewheeling men uh, were conceiving of changing history and putting themselves at the center of events in frontier and borderland regions where there were uncertain boundaries and there were rival territorial claims between nations and Indian peoples, colonials and uh, native peoples. And in that type of environment, ambitious men believe they could transform areas for their own profit and power. And Bowles was one who thought of creating a new state, a state of Muskogee, uh, quite a remarkable uh, deed, even if he would fail in the end and die in the Havana prison after being captured by the Spanish finally and die in Morro prison in Havana in uh, 1805 at the age of 42, but he had a very exciting run while it was uh, going on. And uh, this is uh, the symbol that he devised, or the flag, the banner of the Muskogee State, of the Creek Nation. And this representation of the flag comes from the Spanish archives, uh, the archives of the Indies, uh, the papers, uh, of the Cuban uh, archives that were then transferred to Spain. So we have this in about 1791. Uh, and he's coming to the Florida coast, and he's already developing the idea of a Muskogee nation. Uh, and one of the questions we'll have to ask is, to what degree does that also coincide with the interests and the desires of the people he's trying to lead. That is the Creeks and the Seminoles, a related group of themselves. Now, one thing that Bowles wanted to do, and his entry to the Floridas, was to open up what he called free trade, <coughs> uh, and especially trade between the Bahamas and the island of New Providence, uh, the town of Nassau, on New Providence in the Bahamas, and the Florida Gulf Coast. And his first goal in the Floridas after the war, and he was really covertly sponsored by the British governor of the Bahamas at that time in the mid to late 1780s, the Earl of Dunmore, an amazing character in his own right, who had been uh, the governor of Virginia uh, just at the onset of the American Revolutionary War and issued a famous proclamation in Virginia offering freedom to slaves uh, who would fight for the crown. Uh, Dunmore, himself a very ambitious man, as governor of the Bahamas in 1786, was looking for Englishmen or Anglo-Americans in the islands uh, who, would, who would forward English interests uh, in Florida. And it was really an untested ground. The Spanish had recently regained the Floridas from Britain. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And so Bowles uh, came to be really sponsored by Dunmore as a man who would enter the Floridas, uh, come to the Florida Gulf Coast, and attempt to open up free trade, uh, trade between the Bahamas and uh, the Creeks and other southern Indian nations, and by do so, doing so, uh, offer better terms of trade, better prices for the Indian deerskins, uh, a supply of goods which native peoples were dependent upon, and build up his own prestige and power in the process while he conceived of himself as doing a great uh, humanitarian and social engaging in that type of enterprise. 
uh, to build up the Creeks <coughs> and other southern Indian nations as uh, entities in their own right and forces that would hold on to their land. Okay, well let's move on and relate this to the larger themes. Uh, well, before we do that, <coughs> let's look at one of the ploys of the adventurer. Uh, the adventurers and power brokers of the frontier, North American frontiers and borderlands, were individuals who liked to play with options. Uh, they liked to build leverage, to build bases of support among native groups, among settlers, whatever their constituency was. And then they would often seek to enhance that power through an alliance with a nation state, uh, an imperial government. And Bowles, because he was a Tory and a loyalist during the American Revolutionary War, his natural gambit was to seek British support, covert or overt, for his endeavors in Florida uh, to build up a Muscogee state to open up free trade with the Bahamas, and possibly to oust the Spanish uh, from Florida altogether. In 1790-91, the date when that marvelous portrait of him is painted <coughs> in England, uh, which is in a manor house in England, it's showing him at age 27. And he's wearing a fanciful Indian headdress. Uh, he's uh, wearing a type of tunic or open collar, silk or cotton, certainly a uh, fabric of European manufacture. So it's a combination of a Native American effect or what might appear that way in London. Uh, he, he got much attention. Uh, and a European uh, uh, wear and ornamentation. And here I would direct your attention to the gorget, uh, which is the uh, mark and escutcheon of a British officer uh, of that period. <clears throat> Indeed, during this time, uh, Bowles, as a veteran of the Revolutionary War uh, for the British, and having served in loyalist, loyalist ranks uh, despite his past of desertion, was uh, <coughs> on the British payroll as a re retired well, officer, half pay. Um, so age 27, William Augustus Bowles. He's transforming himself uh, in the age of the American Revolution, going along with the great changes that are occurring uh, continentally. And when he goes to London in 1790, he is traveling uh, from the Bahamas to Canada, seeking the support of the British government there. And then he traverses the ocean uh, to London. And he writes a very lengthy memorial to Lord Grenville, uh, than the British Foreign <coughs> Secretary. And he uh, asks him for support. One, arms and munitions that you can supply to us and that myself as a leader and the Creeks and the Cherokees can use uh, to oust the Spanish uh, from Florida and also Louisiana, which was then under Spanish colonial governance. And uh, this <coughs> Would also, it would also be very helpful if you would further opening trade. Uh, right then, one particular British company had a monopoly on the Florida Indian trade and the trade of all the southern Indian nations as granted by the Spanish. Bowles wanted to break that monopoly. He wanted to get in on the action himself. And he also wanted to create a Muscogee and Creek state and possibly spread that to other Indian nations at the time. So what does he write to Lord Grenville? Your Lordship knows that I have applied to the court of Spain for their acquiescence in our, our having two ports on the coast of Florida. But I believe the Spanish government do not mean to accede to my demand. Yes, he wrote outrageous letters to the, the Spanish authorities in Florida and Cuba and in Spain himself, writing to the foreign minister Florida Blanca and even saying that he would declare war on Spain and on King Carlos uh, IV uh, unless uh, his demands were met. Uh, that didn't stop him from later meeting with the Spanish ambassador in London and saying that if Spain would deal with him, 
he would act honorably toward the Spanish. Uh, the ambassador, Bernardo del Campo, was not particularly impressed uh, and wrote about Bowles as a dangerous, rascally rogue. Uh, Tuno uh, Picaron Osado, daring, rascally rogue. Uh, so, uh, the fact is, to Grenville he's writing, if my demand to the British is not exceeded by the time I arrive in Florida, I shall immediately attack the Spanish fort. Where he's then thinking of Pensacola, for example, which Britain had possessed but lost during the Revolutionary War to Spain. Uh, he's thinking of other forts along the Gulf Coast, <laughs> which are few and weak. And I calculate in the space of two months at furthest, I shall drive the Spaniards from the whole country of the Floridas, and that of New Orleans, and the lower part of Louisiana, and both the Floridas will belong completely to the Creek and Cherokee Nation, which he pictures in London as if the Creeks and Cherokees were one single united nation, which was not the case. So there is some degree of pretension here and inventing and imagining historical realities and then trying to make them occur. Uh, it's, he's dealing with futurity, but actually imagining it or stating it in the present as if it already exists. And he does so to say to Grenville, by the way, uh, if you should not support us, uh, it would be unfortunate for Great Britain. Because then, I'm afraid, the Creeks would have to turn to their old enemies, the Americans, and ally with them. If we are neglected, I suppose they should deem it wise to unite with their old enemies, the Americans. I can tell your lordship what will be the first object of such new formed alliance. It will be an attack upon the British coast along the Great Lakes and in Canada, uh, in which I believe the Creeks uh, will be joined by all the northern Indians. <laughs> so uh, uh, what did Grenville make of all of this? Well, the fact that the document was shared with the Spanish, because it's in the Spanish archive, uh, indicates that uh, he did not want to get directly involved in supporting Bowles. However, Bowles did have English friends, and he was aided in returning to Florida, uh, to the Bahamas, uh, in 1791. And in the fall of that year, he reappeared in Florida. And he immediately would raise a group of Creek warriors, and they would capture the key storehouse of the company that had the monopoly on the Indian trade along the whole Florida uh, Gulf Coast uh, and reaching northward uh, to the lands of the Choctaws and Chickasaws uh, and even the Cherokees. Um, and from that, ep that episode itself uh, is very fascinating. It ultim he ultimately failed in that endeavor, uh, but let's first, we'll come back to that, let's now go to the broader history uh, in which this is occurring. Ah, well, I can't help but have a little more about Bowles. Uh, let's take it to 1801. And it is a complicated history, because in 1792, after capturing the storehouse and looking powerful, and the Spanish are very weak in that area of the Gulf Coast, um, what the governor of Louisiana did, who had the uh, general authority uh, in the area, was send a small detachment by boat, uh, by a schooner, uh, to that area of Appalachie Bay and to assist the Spanish fort there. But there were only 30, 40 Spanish soldiers. Bowles outnumbered them with his creeks. And, and so what the governor of Louisiana did, the Spanish governor, uh, Carondelet, was he invited Bowles for discussions in New Orleans and wrote him a very flattering letter and even had a captain hand him a letter that was supposedly from the uh, Count Florida Blanca himself, still the Spanish foreign minister. That letter was a forgery. That was a fake. It was meant to lure Bowles to New Orleans to say, oh, the Spanish are going to negotiate with you. Maybe they'll work with you. We'll throw out the monopoly Panton Leslie and Company. 
Scottish uh, merchants, and we'll let you uh, open up the trade as you wish under <coughs> Spanish license freely from the Bahamas. But the Spanish don't trust Bowles because they see him not only as an adventurer who can turn to whatever side pleases him, but they see him as English. And after all, he was a Tory. He did fight for the British during the Revolutionary War. Um, so he was jailed in uh, New Orleans, uh, much to his chagrin. He wrote Carondelet, an amazing letter in which he said, it's your only hope. Side with me and the Creeks. We'll support you against the Americans, or else you're going to lose the Gulf Coast region and Louisiana to the Americans. But Carondelet was too wary of this Anglo-American adventure. He sent him to Cuba as a prisoner. Uh, from there, he is sent to Spain as a prisoner. He's not an easy man to jail. Uh, so then the Spanish sent him to the Philippines, <laughs> very far. Uh, eventually, he will come back still, believe it or not, to Florida um, through a number of adventures. The Spanish in, in the Philippines find him a difficult guy to deal with. So they are shipping him back to Spain in 1797 after roughly five years imprisonment. Um, what happens along the west coast of Africa is that he jumps ship, uh, he escapes <coughs> at the slave trading post of Foray, boards a French ship, and then an English, American, and then in English, and he's back to London. <laughs> and he's drumming up support among the English government and English friends that he knows quite well. And that's at the stage for return to the Bahamas, 1799, and to the Florida Gulf Coast, believe it or not, once again, 1799, to raise an army. And this is when he declares a full-fledged state of Muscogee. And there are a number of English adventurers from the Bahamas uh, some living in this region, too, of the continent, southeastern continent, who will support both. But by far the greatest number of supporters he has are the lower Creeks and Seminoles, the Creeks that lived in the more southerly part of the Muscogee uh, Confederacy uh, and the uh, Seminoles, because they felt they weren't getting a good trade deal from Panton and Leslie, uh, the monopoly. Uh, they had little respect for the Spanish. They viewed the previous period of British governance back in the 1760s to 80s as one of greater economic bounty uh, for themselves. Uh, and so they, Bowles had a follow-up. And in 1800, 1801, he was able to capture one Spanish fort. San Marcos de Apalachi, uh, with his whole force being uh, basically Lower Creeks and Seminoles, and a few adventurers uh, under himself, now declaring itself General Bowles. What I, I was looking at this morning again, I had, uh, you know, in history, obviously, we find all these fascinating documents. We're not able always to integrate as many of them in our books. Uh, as we like, as publishers want a uh, word count, you know. They, but here's one interesting one from 1801. It's an English adventurer, John Devereux de Lacy, <coughs> writing to President Jefferson about William Augustus Bowles. The le letter itself is about six pages. And it's worth reading just for the description of Bowles. General Bowles is about 5 foot 10 or 11 inches in height of an elegant athletic form, insomuch that a statuary might well copy from him. Few men combine in their form more grace, symmetry, activity, and vigor than he does. And must, he must, at the age of 24, 25, have been as beautiful as Adonis. <laughs> he is now 40 odd years. In his manner, is he easy, graceful, polite, affable, and pleasing, perfectly the polished gentleman courtier. Speaks the English with an accurate purity few can reach. Speaks the Spanish and French languages, as also the Creek tongue not only well, but fluently. And that was a source of strength for him in Florida, that he did speak from the, the Muscogee language. And from his early days as a runaway soldier living in Perryman's house and having that relationship with Mary, uh, his daughter, which was renewed later in the 1790s. 
Uh, we don't know as much about that as we'd like, but uh, it's definitely they came back together again. And he spoke, speaks the Creek tongue not only well, but fluently. He plays the flute and violin inimitably well in the clarinet and bass violin tolerably. <laughs> <laughs> and is an amateur in painting of which he is so passionately fond as to make it injurious to his health. <laughs> historical painting is his fort and what he is fondest of. That's interesting. I wish we had some of the historical sketches and paintings. We don't. Uh, we have the portrait of him. Uh, but he loved history. And by the way, when he was in exile in the Bahamas immediately after the Revolutionary War, uh, he made a living as a stage actor. <laughs> and his enemies would say, he's just a liar. He's an actor. He's, he's not, uh, he's, uh, the Spanish would say, he's a embustro. He's a liar. He, he's someone, he's an aventurero. He's an adventurer. He's someone who's just um, deceiving the poor Indians. Uh, to build up his own power. But it really wasn't that simple. It was more complex than that. Because many of the Muskogees wanted him. And they wanted a freer trade uh, that they associated with him. And they would have been happy if the British came back as protectors, imperial protectors in that region, um, I believe. Now, the whole concept of borderlands in history relates to these regions uh, that are often contested between rival empires, um, nations, ethnicities, uh, in which there aren't actually clear borderlines. The regions often have adjoining claims of different groups, of different <coughs> ethnicities, of different nations, of different empires, often competing against each other. And that is very commonplace in 18th century uh, North America, 17th century, 16th century for that matter, into the 19th century. And that's why the term borderlands has become such a prominent one in understanding North America over those centuries. <coughs> now, a central theme, which comes from the introduction of the vlog, was that Louisiana of the Floridas were borderland regions characterized by a high degree of geopolitical instability, personal adventurism, and intrigue from the denouement of the Seven Years' War through Louisiana Purchase. Power struggles emerged in which commerce and immigration were as important determinants as war and violence. And indeed, intrigue was very important in these regions because often the various forces involved didn't have many troops, or even if among the Indian peoples, the numbers of warriors that they could mount were significant but limited. And therefore, the politics of bluff, of intrigue, of persuasion, of deception, of leveraging one side against another to build up your own power, uh, were all important. Intrigue also refers to a commercial uh, ties across boundaries. Risk-taking of various <coughs> types across boundaries is how I see adventurism. I see it as colonizing schemes. Adventurism includes colonizing schemes. It includes commerce across national boundaries. Often that is illicit or illegal according to the uh, imperial laws, but occurs anyway. Uh, because people want that. Of course, there are important migration flows, movement of peoples across borders. It's not only a changing imperial map, but we look at the movement of peoples that occurs when certain regions pass from one power to another. And in this period, both Louisiana <coughs> and Florida, quote, are indeterminate geographically often, and they're changing position from one imperial power to another. But what will that mean in terms of actual control? And here we can turn, for example, to two key dates, but not to look here I'm talking about colonial adventurism as including several elements. One of those which Bowles specialized in, in fact, Bowles is a classic adventurer because he is involved in all three of these prime examples of adventurism risk-taking and cross-national and ethnic boundaries for personal profit and power, 
colonize it through colonizing schemes, number one, venturing capital and trade, especially in illicit trade. He would like that to become, of course, uh, legalized if he can get an imperial power to back it. And freebooting, uh, which is privately organized, uh, military incursions and invasions. And of course, after the birth of the US, the possibility of incursions and illegal military enterprises, or let's say unauthorized military enterprises, by <coughs> private individuals, whether US or like bowls of Torah, become more possible. Because the United States initially had very little control over its far-flung uh, Western territories west of the Appalachians. And there were many Anglo-Americans. There were already Britons in the Floridas at that time and in New Orleans. And they want to stay. They want to carve out their own space under Spanish rule. And others are appealing to the Spanish to come in peacefully while others are plotting armed invasion. So it's a, it's a conspiratorial environment, but also with a lot of negotiation. Uh, going on at the same time. Well, let's talk about the boundaries historically. And we see a map here of the 1760s, a French <coughs> map of Florida. Oh, it's in English, actually. They copied <coughs> a lot from the French, who were more knowledgeable geographically of this region than the English at the time. And it's showing the region of Florida and Louisiana. But, of course, these names didn't mean the same thing in the 1760s as they mean today. Uh, Florida, in 1763, passed from Spanish title to British. How, how did that happen? Seven Years' War, last year of the Seven Years' War, 1762. The British besieged Havana. It's a key object of the war once uh, Spain and Britain come to war in early 1762. The British, with a couple thousand Anglo-American soldiers assisting them, take Havana from the Spanish in August 1762. <coughs> Havana tremendously valued. In the peace negotiations, what happens is that the British restore possession of Havana to the Spanish. In return, Spain cedes all of its claim to Florida, to Great Britain. Also in that same year, 1760, well, 1763, in the formal peace treaty making, uh, France cedes all of its claims from the eastern part of the Mississippi uh, to the rest of the parts of the continent that it claimed to Great Britain. France seats Canada, all territory it claims east of the Mississippi River, with the exception of the Mormons <coughs> and the Mississippi Delta. But there's also a secret agreement going on in 1762, at the same time the negotiations are occurring between the British, the French, and the Spanish, in which Britain is gaining continental territories on paper. What are they going to be making use of them? What about their relations with the native peoples? What about mediating between colonials, their own colonials, and Indian peoples? That's uncertain. Uh, but there is, at the same time in 1762, a secret agreement between the French and the Spanish. Uh, France has lost Canada, sees no purpose in retaining Louisiana. And by a secret accord, uh, the French monarch Louis the fifteenth uh, seeds Louisiana uh, to his younger cousin uh, Carlos the third of Spain. So now Spain will be the sovereign in Louisiana, much to the chagrin of the French Louisianans, who didn't learn about the terms of the peace treaty for almost two years, and then they found out they're going to be under Spanish governance and no longer their ancestral France, and they are not happy. And that will lead to difficulties, including a revolt in New Orleans in 1768 against French rule. And that, that's, the only, that's the moment when the Spanish start to notice uh, Louisiana, when they are humiliated and their governor is sent packing. And then they will send an armed invasion force to really 
uh, say we are sovereign over Louisiana. That's in 1769. So the fact is, in 1763, the British here are for the first time in Florida. And the British are very ambitious. And they also have colonists, as well as colonial officials, who want to <coughs> extend commerce, who want to extend colonization in this area, far beyond what it had previously attained. And the British create two colonies, one they call East Florida, with the capital of St. Augustine. The French Spanish evacuate completely. They're gone. You know, we associate Florida with the Spanish, 1763, the Spanish evacuate St. Augustine. They are gone. They even take some of the bones of the old governors, the British write. You can't believe it. <laughs> They're taking some of the bones of the governors and the saints uh, to Havana. So the Spanish leave St. Augustine and Pensacola. The British create the two colonies and the West Florida, the British designate Pensacola as its capital. It also <coughs> includes the former French garrison of Mobile, a point for the Indian trade. So you have a West Florida and an East Florida as British colonies. And the British soon extend the boundary of West Florida northward, northward to the Yazoo River to take in Natchez the crucial Natchez district with the most fertile soil, perhaps in all of North America. And that is included in British West Florida. Now, in the interest of time, and you see the map here of the British Florida and the claims here, of course, we'd have to look at the native peoples and their place on the map to understand what's going on and uh, to see the place of the Choctaws, uh, the Creeks, the Cherokees and others. Of course, they're well to the north, but we have many native peoples that are affected by these imperial changes and are going to uh, still be vibrant and play off one power against another and see, uh, of course, how they can uh, maneuver to the best effect they can to survive in a changing and rapidly transforming world in which now they have to deal with the British directly. All right, we come to the American Revolutionary War. Spain at first was neutral in the Revolutionary War, and I'll, I'll make some comments and kind of summarize things up. But I want to say something about the impact of the American Revolutionary War, which we don't usually associate with Florida or Louisiana. And yet, that was a very fascinating theater. And I discussed that in my book before coming to Bowles. Bowles is a product of the changes produced by the American Revolutionary War, which he served in. Bernardo de Galvez <laughs> is a very important figure, appointed the governor of Louisiana, of Spanish Louisiana, in 1776. And he was a very, very forceful, strong figure, very bold. And uh, what he did in the early stages of the American Revolutionary War was to send shipments of arms and supplies to the Americans <coughs> up the Mississippi River with the Americans coming down to New Orleans. And clearly, Galvez was doing that because he saw the American Revolution, as the Spanish saw it, as an attempt to weaken the British Empire. Britain was the enemy. Galvez wasn't aiding the Americans because he loved the Americans. No, he, he did not. Uh, but rather, it was to weaken Britain. And when American raiders came down the Mississippi in 1778 and created havoc, seized large numbers of slaves in British Florida, Natchez, and other districts. They found shelter in New Orleans under Galvez. And there was a lot of chaos in this area during part of the Revolutionary War. And then things change in 1779. 1779, Spain decides to enter the war against Britain. 
Spain is entering the war as an ally of France. And Galvez isn't one to sit in New Orleans. He's going to mount attacks on British territory. And the British don't expect how aggressive he's going to be. And he summons all the militia of Louisiana he can. A lot of French, uh, even blacks, uh, those of mixed ancestry, the so-called mulattoes, uh, Indians uh, in his force, as well as Spanish regulars. Of 1,500 men, roughly. They cross 100 miles of swampland in the middle of the summer. And then they attack British posts along the Mississippi at Baton Rouge. They take that. The British surrender. They surrender the Nash Natchez district to uh, the Spanish. But Galvez has bigger things and objects in mind. In 1780, with huge assistance from Cuba, the Spanish launch an attack on Mobile. Mobile falls to the Spanish in 1780, a victory over the Britons. Uh, that the Spanish, of course, relished tremendously uh, in the era when uh, Britain, of course, usually got the upper hand. And then in 1781, Galvez led, again with tremendous assistance from Cuba and a force of some 8,000 uh, soldiers and many ships of the line, uh, a powerful armada, uh, he besieged Pensacola, and the British lost Pensacola. They surrendered there in May 1781. So what's going to be the result of that? That's going to affect the history of continental North America. And not only boundary lines, but the people who live there, the native peoples, of course, tremendously. Um, and as well as change colonial flows and the movement of people. But what's going to happen in the peace treaty of 1783 is that, first of all, Britain's going to make its first treaty with the U.S. in 1782. They negotiate that. The U.S. <coughs> negotiates without telling the French, their allies, about what's going on, because the U.S. wants the best deal for themselves. Britain says, the American law is a, war is a loser. We've got to get out of the American war so we can concentrate our naval forces against the British and the French and Spanish and prevent the Spanish from, and French from taking Gibraltar, which the British managed to do, and in winning sea battles in the Atlantic and Caribbean. The fact is that Britain gave the U.S. a very favorable peace because they could not win the American war, and they wanted to now focus their en energies against the Spanish and French. The war didn't end, therefore, at Yorktown. Uh, it did continue. Um, moreover, in the peace treaty of 1783, Britain, which had lost Florida, gave up all claim to West Florida and said, even though the Spanish hadn't conquered East Florida, they said, we don't want it anymore. We can't use it. Let's give it to the Spanish. Let them worry about the Americans. So what set up from the Revolutionary War, and that'd be a good point to close and time to sum up. What's left from the Revolutionary War is a situation now where an independent United States with great territorial claims, but limited control over territories and even sometimes over its own citizens, is bordering Spanish territory. And of course, native peoples fear uh, with reason, Anglo-American colonial expansionism, which is going to gather pace. And meanwhile, you have various negotiations going on. Spain now resumes control of, quote, Florida, including east and west. The British are gone. If the British had held on to the Floridas during the war, they could have used them almost like a Canada uh, in the Southern Theater. Um, and because a lot of loyalists had fled to East Florida at the end of the war, 5,000 <coughs> bringing 8,000 slaves with them fled into East Florida. And then they learned that the British government ceded them their territory to Spain. And they were shocked. And some of them say, what can we do now? One guy proposes to the Spanish governor, he writes, uh, he writes Galvez, he writes various people, he says, let me, if you will, I'll stay here in Florida and be a loyal subject of just give me a territorial control of the coastline and the Florida-Georgia frontier 
uh, give it to me and other loyalists as a land grant, and we will protect that area against the Americans. Of course, this wasn't granted because that fellow wasn't trusted by the Spanish. But all types of bargaining is going on. The point is that the Spanish conquest of British West Florida during the war was an important part of not only the American Revolutionary War, but the other conflict that coincided with it, uh, wars between Britain and France, and Spain and Great Britain. Um, and so let me just show you a few slides to catch up and be happy to take a few questions. This is a fantastic map at the de Gaulle Library in, at SMU, which shows you, it, it's a French map of 1782, and it's called The Course of War, the Suite du Théâtre de la Guerre, and it is showing you the territorial changes produced by the war. It shows you extension of the U.S. boundaries, but it also shows you that this is West Florida, this is East Florida, and now they are Spanish. Will that block the Americans? What about the native peoples pictured on the map? This insert shows you the British surrendering to the Americans at, at Yorktown, but in this part of the map describes Galvez's siege of Pensacola and the British surrender to the Spanish there and the Spanish victory. And this is a highlight, a closer version of that map, uh, where you see the southerly portion. And you see the French mapmaker uh, saying, calling this Texas, New Mexico, or New Hope, Mexico, it's in the general area, uh, Western Florida, <laughs> Eastern Florida, Georgia, and so forth. And also writing in the Indian peoples. In the area. <coughs> a changing map. And uh, of course, mm. After the war, in the Creek Territory, we have new leaders emerge, such as Alexander McGillivray, Scottish by background, and Indian, and Creek by his mother's line, and that made him a Creek. We don't have, we can't identify him exactly that this was McGillivray, but it may have been, that is, this is the portrait historically accurate. The fact is, McGillivray was a power to be reckoned with as a Creek leader, the foremost chief, and the guy, because he knew English, he could negotiate with the Americans, he could negotiate with the Spanish. Uh, he was uh, well-educated in European ways, uh, and he was loyal to the Creeks, but also to the House of Panton and Leslie, uh, that is, that company that had the monopoly on the Indian trade. And at first, he and Bowles got along, and then Bowles turned against him and was going to try to overthrow him. And McGillivray did not expect that opposition and is in a very hot seat. Um, and he dies uh, in 1793 of natural causes. He, he more or less drunk himself and he, to death and with uh, some degree of debauchery, too, um, fell victim to that. But he was a very forceful presence uh, for a time in the 1780s. Uh, the American Spanish and British thought, I mean, the Americans and Spanish both thought that this guy is the paramount leader. But what's going on beneath the surface in the <coughs> Indian country? That's not as clear uh, to the imperial states. Uh, Muscogee Man, Wilkinson, who figures significantly in the book as the arch power broker, um, an American general is also in the pay of Spain and a map of the Southern Dominions of the United States, 1804, 1794. Some of the changes of the period, and finally back to William Augustus Bowles. And the conclusion is that this region is a very a significant one in North American history. One of my goals was to integrate the region into the continental picture, the transatlantic influences, uh, the ties to the Caribbean as well, the Bahamas, and to not just look at the empires and governments, but the private actors, the individuals who were the adventurers, the power brokers, those who are <coughs> part of colonizing schemes of commercial entries, of freebooting enterprises, and their relationships with the native peoples as well. And so, therefore, the past uh, lives on.
Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
But one thing about those who planned to unify the native world was it was very hard because native peoples had their own loyalties on the village level, on the clan level, and they had great disagreements often among themselves. And in the 1760s, you have a conflict between the Choctaws and the Creeks. In the uh, <coughs> 1790s, one faction of the Chickasaws is at war with the Creeks for about five years, and the Spanish are trying to stop, get them to stop it, so they'll unify against the Americans. But it's a very hard business. And some of these mestizo leaders, like not McGillivray, because he's no longer alive, uh, but the mestizo le leaders uh, in the Indian country, Colbert among the Chickasaws, Pitchlin among the Choctaws, these are going to be very influential families for generations. And they are going to be significant figures negotiating the um, treaties with the U.S. and Indian removal um, to, to Oklahoma. They're not the only people, but they're very important uh, powers uh, out of proportion to their number in uh, Indian country. We have about time for maybe one more question. One more question? Maybe. Jeff, please. Yes, hi. hi. How are you doing? Um, I'm just wondering if um, Bowles was just after self aggrandizement or no. really, he really had the interests of anybody other than himself? <laughs> well, that's impossible to know, but I think it's a great question. And yeah, he was a self aggrandizer. Um, he was a man who had limited education, but he was from a middling class background in Maryland. And uh, he was certainly felt a British loyalty, after all, enlisting as a Tory soldier at 14, age 14, uh, with a Maryland unit fighting in Pennsylvania before being shipped to Florida. And that changed his life when he was shipped to Pensacola to assist the British war effort there. And then his uh, going to live among the Creeks, and then coming back to fight with the British against the Spanish in the Siege of Pensacola. So there's a biography of him written in London about 1790, which is written by a friend of his and is self-promotional. So how much can we rely upon him? Yeah, he was a self aggrandizer One thing he would not stop. This man would not stop. And finally, in 1803, he's running out of room. And the U.S. and the Spanish, and some of the upper creeks who don't trust Bowles, uh, they intrigue to capture him. And they capture him when he expects to negotiate again. And then he's sent to Cuba, and this is for the last time. So it is an amazing story, and I uh, uh, wanted to uh, tell you, share that drama with you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mayer.